America is more than a place. It's a promise, which we strive daily to realize. And when our politics veers away from that promise, Nobody likes me. it is our solemn duty to stand up and demand better. Now is that time, and the Convention on Founding Principles is our chance. Thank you for joining this movement to chart a better, more principled way forward for the nation. Good evening and welcome back to the Convention on Founding Principles. If you're joining us tonight for the first time, thank you for choosing to be a part of this critical effort to renew our politics. I'm sure Michael Singleton and we have a great lineup of speakers for you tonight. Tonight, our theme is a shining city on a hill. That phrase has been imprinted into the minds of Americans ever since President Reagan first used it to describe our great nation. But what does it mean? And more importantly, what does it take to live up to such a great responsibility? I wanna bring in my friends, Brad and Reed. And, and guys, before we get into some questions and back and forth, I wanna go over a few major developments that are developing around the country right now. Uh, we know that over 180,000 Americans have died from coronavirus. We have Hurricane Laura looming on the Gulf Coast. And so we ask our friends, if you live in that area, please be sure to follow emergency directives. And recently, Brad and Reed, 24, 48 hours ago, we were just talking about race relations. And we have an African-American man by the name of Jacob Blake was just shot seven times in the back by a white police officer. I want to get you guys take on everything that's going on. I'll start with you first, Reed. This is a real time with our country's track record on race. And what we're seeing in the streets of Kenosha is an uprising demanding that we get better as a country. It's far past time that we do. And Shermichael, I just wanna point something out here. Earlier yesterday, there was a 17-year-old man who went out into the streets of protesters and shot three people, killing two. And this is what's going to happen in Donald Trump's America, where he chooses to elevate two people like Mark and Patricia Mikulski to the stage of the Republican National Convention. They showed their guns to protesters. They handled it. They did not handle their firearms well. And Donald Trump rewarded them out of a white grievance politics. And so what we saw in Kenosha with the unfortunate deaths because of this young, angry man is directly, the blood is directly on the hands of President Trump. And Brad, I wanna get your take and I wanna be clear for our audience. Um, the gentleman is still alive. He is paralyzed by the most recent news reports that we have, but thankfully he's still with us. Brad, what's your take on uh, what's going on, in, going on in the country? And more importantly, how do you think our principles are better suited to address where the country currently stands? You know, first, I, my heart goes out to that young gentleman that was shot uh, in the back seven times, not just because he was shot, but because he was shot in front of his three sons. And I'm a father myself, uh, and I can't imagine anything happening to me uh, like that in front of my uh, in front of my young son, much less having two more sons on top of that. And so my heart uh, personally goes out to uh, his family, my thoughts and prayers are with them. Uh, but as it relates to the entire tone of the nation, uh, people are angry and they're frustrated and they're tired of the lack of leadership and there needs to be a calming voice at the helm uh, to be honest that can really speak to a, a space of unity for americans and i think that that's why it's so important uh, especially tonight as we focus on the city on a hill it was about being a place for all americans uh, where everyone could come where uh, president reagan talked about there might be walls but there were doors for everyone to come through uh, where everyone could be safe and it was on a foundation uh, that was firm as rocks that oceans could not deter that they could not bring down and i think that's the kind of firm leadership that americans are looking for that they're crying out for uh today and, and reed really really quickly before i let you guys go talk a little about a little bit about our principles how are our principles necessary for this time that the nation finds itself in? Of course, sure, Michael. You know, I'll say that one of the principles I'm really proud our convention has put forward is principle number one, that all people are created equal and endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. And in that principle, it specifically rejects 
the evil ideologies of racism, including white supremacy. And so that's what is at stake here is, are we gonna build a movement that goes forward that embraces all people and that roots out racism in our society? And I'll say one last thing about the uprisings and the protests that we're seeing in our country right now. Martin Luther King said that our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. So the best guarantee against these riots is progress, is fighting poverty, bringing about true justice and equality. Thank you guys so much. And if you're watching, we want you guys to comment on our YouTube page, comment on Facebook, and make sure you're tweeting with the hashtag CFP2020. The plight of refugees is one that absolutely demands our attention. And our willingness as a people to accept them with open arms is critical to create in a world where victims of persecution can find safe harbor and ultimately a world where the ones who flee in terror or dictators who deny their basic human rights. One of the worst lies that Donald Trump has perpetrated on the American people is the lie that foreigners seeking refuge or even just an opportunity in our country are somehow unworthy of entry or worse yet, a threat to our prosperity. His nativist xenophobic bigotry may play with the extremists and white supremacists infecting his base, but the net result of his draconian immigration policies has been weaken and weaken us as a nation. No one knows that better than the man who once was responsible for promoting trade, industry, economic prosperity in America, other than former Commerce Secretary Carlos Gutierrez. My name is Carlos Gutierrez. I'm a former Secretary of Commerce and former Chairman and CEO of the Kellogg Company. It's a pleasure to be with you. President Calvin Coolidge once said, the business of America is business. And he was known to be a man of few words, but that is a quote that has stuck over time. It's not that the business of America is politics. Business is a value, not necessarily an activity. It's part of our culture. It's part of our ethical values. In fact, there's probably nothing as American as a little kid opening up a lemonade stand. Uh, we are a country of risk takers. We promote risk taking. We're a country of entrepreneurs. We're a country of dreamers. 47% of our employment comes from new and small businesses. And especially important are those small and new businesses that become big businesses over time. One example is the company I worked at, Kellogg. That was a very small business at one time. Microsoft was a very small business. Apple was a very small business. Ford was a very small business. That is the history of our country. And that is the contribution of business to our society. There's also a great deal of honor in doing business. Corporations, I believe, are some of the most ethical institutions that we have, yet they are given a reputation that they don't deserve, mainly by people who don't put business first, who don't agree with President Coolidge that the business of America is business. In corporations, you have values, you have a positive culture. People are developed, people are taught to work in a meritocracy. They're provided benefits. Corporations change my life. The Kellogg Company gave me an opportunity not just to rise up in the ranks, but to support my family. So I can't listen to criticisms of corporations because I know firsthand what great institutions they are. Business people know that the best compliment they can receive is for someone to say, it's a privilege to do business with you. That means that they're recognized as being someone of honor, someone that can be trusted, someone that believes in fairness. We are a country of dreams, and anyone who stands in the way of dreams is not suitable to lead the U.S.
FDR once said famously that we want people to have freedom from want. Very famous quote, and it's still quoted today. I don't know if I agree with that. And I don't believe I have ever agreed with that. We want people who do want. We want people who want to aspire. We want people who want to dream. We want people who want to reach, to want to achieve. We welcome people who thrive, people who are not satisfied, but they want to do more. That is what makes this the greatest country in the world. We're a country of accomplishments, only country in the world. And I've lived in many countries around the world. This is the only country in the world where if you call someone competitive, it's a compliment. Competitive, ambitious, a driver, someone who wants to achieve more. That is the essence of the US and that is the essence of our business culture. The big difference between Republicans and members of the other party is uh, that they don't understand, the other party doesn't understand the profit motive. They don't understand that if a company doesn't make money, they can't reinvest, they're gonna have to close up and they're gonna have to lay off all their workers. They criticize corporations and they criticize multinational companies as if though they were the worst thing that has happened to humanity. Republicans understand that the real heroes of our economy are business people, not the government, business people. It's very rare for a Republican to support policies that hurt businesses. And it's also extremely rare to hear a Republican talk anti-business rhetoric. It's just something that we had never heard before because Republicans are firm. We are firm on our belief in our free enterprise system. So just because a business person like the CEO of Merck, Fraser, just because he spoke out against Charlottesville doesn't mean that a Republican should attack his company and all of a sudden attack the pricing of pharmaceutical companies because they have a difference in political understanding or political belief. We may want people to say, boy, this administration took on China and they stood up to China. But what we're not talking about is the hurt on businesses, how much we have impacted businesses by putting on tariffs, by prohibiting US companies from doing business in countries or doing business with other companies. We're talking about companies that employ hundreds of thousands of people. And if they lose those markets because someone in government has an emotional uh, problem with a given country and they want to show that they're big and tough and strong, uh, companies are putting their employees at risk and companies will be hurt. And our trade policy has cost billions and has cost jobs and it has cost higher prices. And in the end, in the end, our trade deficit is higher today than it was before we started the trade war. Social media companies have become very big. Now all of a sudden it's become fashionable to criticize them because they're too big. What we don't realize, what members of the, uh, what Democrats don't realize, is that they have to compete with the likes of Huawei. They have to compete with the likes of Tencent. They have to compete with the likes of Alibaba. Why would a pro-business Republican want to break up companies and make them less competitive? All those companies started small. 
and through grit, through determination, they became big. They did what they were supposed to do. Pro business does not pay attention only to the stock market. Being a pro business Republican doesn't mean that you use the stock market as a barometer. It means that you pay attention to the thousands and thousands of small businesses and entrepreneurs who are risking their well being, who are risking everything to create a company that one day will be big and one day will thrive and one day will employ a lot of people. There's a reason why businesses and many Republicans understand that we need immigration. People say that it's businesses wanting cheap labor. No, it's businesses who understand that our working age population is not growing fast enough to suit the needs of business. It's not any other Machiavellian uh, theory or Machiavellian reason. And it's wrong for a Republican to be against legal immigration. And we're not talking about farm workers. We're talking about everyone. Yes, farm workers, but also PhDs and nurses and doctors, people who make our economy grow and thrive. We need those people. And it's very anti-business for a Republican president to be against legal immigration. It's a very provincial point of view. Pro-business Republicans don't attack companies for getting big. And we have to remember that. And we have a history of that. So maybe we don't like what CNN uh, says on their programs, or maybe we don't like that Amazon owns the Washington Post, but that is not a reason to want to break up Amazon or to criticize a great American company like Amazon. Those things hurt the reputation of business. And I believe that Republicans have the responsibility to honor businesses, to ensure that they have a good reputation, to ensure that people know their contributions to society, and above all, the honesty and the ethics of business. Republicans need to speak out more to support businesses. So the business of America is not self-dealing. The business of America is not corruption. The business of America is not cronyism. The business of America is honest, noble, private enterprise, our honest and noble free enterprise system that has made us who we are. Thank you very much and have a nice conference. Thank you, Secretary Gutierrez. Rosario Marin was appointed treasurer of the United States by our last Republican president, George W. Bush. Now she's one of the key members of 43 alumni for Biden, a group of former Bush appointees who oppose Donald Trump and support Joe Biden. She sat down earlier with her former colleagues, Frank Lavin, James Glassman, and Jimmy Garule. Let's take a look. I know for a fact that uh, we all serve um, under circumstances that were very, very difficult, clearly, as Jimmy mentioned, and all of us were aware of 9-11. I, I do want to share one thing with, um, with uh, all of you, and that is uh, soon after that, uh, the president called a few, uh, maybe a hundred, maybe a little bit more than that, uh, of his um, uh, people to, to the White House. And he talked about, uh, at that moment, how he felt that each and every one of us was being called to serve our nation in its greatest hour of need. I remember feeling so happy and overwhelmed. The reality is, in fact, America was facing very, very difficult times. And all of us were chosen 
to lead this nation at the at, at its greatest need, at the hour of its greatest need. And somehow I feel today we are called again to do the same thing, to raise our voices, to do the best that we can from our own places, whatever it is that we're doing. Uh, our nation is calling out for our help, for our commitment, for our service. And so why? Because character counts. And right now, we must be that beacon of light and beacon of hope. And it is up to us. And so with that, please let me have uh, a round again with uh, Jimmy and, and the other ambassadors uh, to talk a little bit more about this. This is a time where uh, character must count, integrity, honesty. And so, uh, Jimmy, can you share a little bit more about your feelings about why that is important? Yeah, I'd actually like to, to, to take off on a point that, uh, that Jim was making, and uh, that involves character and the rule of law. So over the last approximately three and a half years, it's been uh, readily apparent that our democracy is fragile and not guaranteed. The cornerstone of our democracy is the rule of law. The fundamental characteristics of the rule of law include equal justice under the law. No one is above the law, including the president of the United States and the impartial administration of justice free from political pressure and interference. Under article two, section three of the constitution, the president, quote, shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed, faithfully. As such, the president has a constitutional duty to uphold the rule of law, to be faithful to the rule of law. Preservation of the rule of law requires, requires a president who is a person of integrity and committed to upholding, defending, and promoting this sacred principle, the rule of law. And I agree with Jim, the core of integrity is truthfulness. And sadly today, we have a president who's at war with the truth uh, virtually every day uh, of his administration. The rule of law has been under constant attack during the last three and a half years by the person who has taken an oath to defend the constitution. The constant assault on the rule of law threatens our democracy. Moreover, and this is what I fear, four more years of abuse of the rule of law could cause irreparable damage to our democracy. Well, I do not mean to be an alarmist, what is at stake during the upcoming presidential election is the preservation of, our, of, of democracy as we know it, a democracy based on the rule of law. And therefore it's so important that we elect a president who's faithful to his constitutional duty, to faithfully execute the law, and who's faithful to the rule of law. Excellent. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, Ambassador Levin. Tell thank us you. Um, uh, yeah. Go ahead, share, share with us. Thank, thank, thank you, Rosario. And, and look, I think uh, Jimmy and Jim both just made some terrific points, and they feed in directly is what I've seen. I do most of my work overseas. Uh, and what's fascinating to me in everyday conversations with folks, how hungry they are for U.S. connectivity, that the United States is typically the preferred partner for most folks overseas. And that means in, in terms of business, that means in terms of holidays, in terms of where they want their kids educated, in terms of their own cultural appetite, the movies they want to watch or the sports teams they follow. So they want that U.S. connectivity. And there's enormous respect for the United States in general, in general, but we've seen that deteriorate in the last few years and it ties very much into what Jim's been saying and what Jimmy's original point was, Jim's comment on honesty is spot on. Uh, honesty is not just the best policy, but it's also a sign of a, prefer, a professional mature relationship that somebody you respect you're honest with and you can talk openly about shortcomings and challenges as well as opportunities and good news. Uh, and you typically get that from Americans, and that's a, a strength of our society. And Jimmy's spot on, too, that if you don't begin the conversation with a degree of respect for the other person's culture and tradition and language and habits, uh, there's no reason that person should respect you. And what's really uh, sad and at times painful for me as an American is to see how the current administration 
uses as its primary international management tool, it uses friction. It uses uh, negative comments, negative approaches, grievances, what it doesn't like. I said, all right, that can be part of anybody's approach, but it shouldn't be the exclusive or even the dominant approach. And trying to navigate internationally by using friction or using negative comments is like trying to drive your car by only using your horn. And to say, you've got to find a way to lay off your horn and make friends with people around the world rather than create ill will. So I would say Trump is a master pianist, but there's only one note on his piano. And it's a negative note. And that's all he can do is hit that note. And after a while, it is fatiguing and it costs the U.S. internationally. We don't have that reservoir of goodwill and that connectivity that we historically have had. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think we see that. We see it here domestically, but you're out there. You're out there in, in, in throughout the world. And um, I was sharing with some people that um, last year I was very fortunate to travel to 20 countries wow. for different reasons. Not one individual, not one in the 20 countries, different, all kinds of different languages that say what a great president you have. It was it was always this look, this, how did you get that guy? How did you do this? Why did you do this? And it was almost embarrassing, um, but that's the way it is. And, and, and this is just uh, another sign that we had lost that leadership position we had uh, in the world. Um, so in, in that regard, uh, uh, James, if you can share a little bit more with us, how do you see um, having more integrity, more honesty, how, how can we get that um, in, in, in the next administration, should it not be uh, the current one? Well, you know, I think Rosaria starts at the top. Uh, you know, you, you can't really say much more than that. I think that it's important for Americans not to despair and to understand that uh, we can restore the kind of... Uh, culture and government that we had before. I mean, I, I unfortunately, I, I mean, I, I agree with what Jimmy said about democracy being fragile. It's hard to believe that, uh, that Americans are now feeling that way. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe that we felt that way many times since the Civil War. We really didn't. I mean, this is something brand new. Let me just say one thing about respect, uh, the word that Frank used, and this sounds very small, but it's something that always impressed me about President Bush. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of time with President Bush when I was at the State Department, but I, I certainly did afterwards when I was helping him with the, with the Bush Library. And every meeting that he had, that he called, he was smack on time. Meetings started right on time. And that is a gesture of respect for the time of the people who are involved. And of course, we respected the president's time, no doubt, but he respected our time. Um, let me make one, one last uh, comment about character, and I hope this doesn't sound too self-serving for the people who are participating um, in, in this terrific event. But, you know, it does take something, it does take some character to stand up as someone who has been a member of a Republican administration or many Republican administrations in the case of Frank and say, we're not voting for a Republican this time. We're not supporting a Republican this time. Um, we are supporting a Democrat. We're supporting somebody that we need to restore the country or, or share, shore up this democracy that we are in danger frankly, of losing. So that requires some, some character. And I think the people who are watching this should understand that there are times when you have to stand up. And this is one of those times. I want to bring in Evan and Mindy to talk a little bit more, a little bit more about this. So Mindy, what do you think the significance is of having former alum of the Bush administration endorse Joe Biden over the current Republican president? Yeah, well, let me tell you, I mean, first of all, some of these 43 alumni uh, for, for Biden are, are, are friends of mine and, and former colleagues. You know, they are people who served the president, some of them 
um, you know, directly at the White House. Some of them, his campaign or the RNC or at the RNC while he was president. Some of them, you know, all the way up to being kind of former, uh, you know, secretaries like Carlos Gutierrez and 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 assistant secretaries and undersecretaries like you just heard. And you know, many of these people are not used to being political. So the people that you just heard, you know, weren't necessarily always political. They've been kind of quiet for many years. And, you know, they were all even quiet in 2016 if they had their reservations about Donald Trump. And so this was not an easy decision for them to come out and kind of poke their head up and, and put them, make themselves vulnerable, expose themselves as kind of, you know, people who are standing up and endorsing the Democratic president. You know, many of them, some of them were, uh, you know, they've been Republicans, most of them their entire life. This is not something that they would imagine that they would really ever ever do. And so, you know, I think it's quite stunning. You know, we see kind of an unprecedented uh, event happening with the number of notable Republicans and, and Republican kind of grassroots across the country who are deciding and, and making clear and, and raising their voice that they will not vote for Donald Trump. And I think the fact that, you know, those who kind of served in the White House for George W. Bush, and, and even many of them who, you know, have not been political actors, but are strong Republicans, feel compelled to do this is is pretty, uh, you know, remarkable and stunning. And, and the last thing that I would just say is that, you know, for them, um, you know, having spoken with many of them, you know, they'll say freely, we don't, you know, they're, they're kind of fan the spectrum kind of ideologically, but for many of them, they say, you know, I, I've never voted for a Democrat. And ideologically, you know, and policy wise, I don't agree with Joe Biden, but really for me, this is what they'll say, it's about character and it's about integrity. And, and more than anything, it's about, putting themselves behind someone that they believe will commit themselves to serving the country over serving their own self-interest. And, and Evan, in thinking about character and integrity, serving the country over one's self-interest, last week at the Democratic National you heard from Jimmy Carter, you saw Bill Clinton, you saw former President Barack Obama, but this week there's someone missing and that's former President George W. Bush. That's right. You know, let, I want to address that, Jermichael, but before I even get there, just listening to these to these panelists, these these uh, 43 panelists, these former these statesmen and, and women um, talking about our national situation. What strikes me is just how appalled they are, just how um, just shocked they are by the direction of, of our country under this administration, under this Republican president. You know, it, it, it's very easy to become de uh, to, to become um, desensitized, I guess, to to sort of the violations of our institutions, our ideals and norms by this administration. But every once in a while, you come across somebody who hasn't been desensitized, and that's what listening to that panel was like. And it's you know, we all I think need to strive to stay in that in that space because the more we sort of get used to all these violations of our principles the easier it becomes for anyone to continue to violate them. And then our liberty is at, at great risk. But it is, as you point out, very strange that George W. Bush isn't at the Republican convention uh, this week. Why is that, we have to ask ourselves. And, and I want to offer a couple of answers. One is that imagine if George W. Bush was addressing this convention, the Republican convention, rather, this week. Uh, you know that he would speak um, he would, you would imagine that he might speak from our principles, the principles that we've articulated, that our, our delegates have drafted and, and uh, are ratifying. You know, he, he would give a speech that is more in line with the kinds of things we're talking about at the Convention on Founding Principles. And for that reason, they just can't have him. The other reason is that President Trump wants this to be a Trump show, both the convention and the party, and then the country as a whole. And he's just not able to bring in a team of others who can unite the country, who can, can truly unite the party and lead the country forward. He just can't do it for whatever personal you know, issue he has. You know, with, he has a fairly serious issue with, with narcissism, I think it's clear. He just can't bring in or allow other leaders to come in and, and build this party and, mm -hmm. uh, and serve the country well. Right. Well, thanks, Evan and Mindy, and we'll be seeing more of you later on throughout the show. There couldn't be a more stark contrast between the messages coming from the RNC and the ones on display by our speakers here. One key difference you'll see tonight is that we honor civil servants who put service and truth above even their own well-being. 
It can be easy to focus on the people who are complicit in corruption and abuses of power, but we shouldn't forget the many patriotic Americans who have stood up for what is right. And this is the only convention this week that will honor those men and those women. Let's take a look. Donald Trump is a phony, a fraud. His promises are as worthless as a degree from Trump University. He has neither the temperament nor the judgment to be president. Senator John McCain described the president's meeting as one of the most disgraceful performances by an American president in memory. The damage inflicted by President Trump's naivete, egotism, false equivalence, and sympathy for autocrats is difficult to calculate. Now the former Defense Secretary James Mattis accusing President Trump of being a threat to the Constitution, writing, we are witnessing the consequences of three years without mature leadership. Both President Putin and President Trump are, are in a state of denial. This is what happens when you're drowning in a sea of lies. Truth matters. Working off of facts is not the trademark of the deep state, but of the deeply committed state. I certainly don't hold up President Trump as a leader. I don't think he is. And he's so routinely dismissive of him. I never thought I'd see an American president uh, throw the intelligence community under the bus like that. I think uh, President Trump is taking us down the road to tyranny. We have, as American citizens, have a decision to make here. Are we going to stand by and let politicians and leaders clearly cooperate on some level with a foreign power? I found the July 25th phone call unusual. Such selective actions undermine the rule of law. I will be fined for telling the truth. What the president did was wrong, grievously wrong. With my vote, I will tell my children and their children that I did my duty to the best of my ability, believing that my country expected it of me. I will only be one name among many. We are all footnotes at best in the annals of history, but in the nation conceived in liberty and justice, that distinction is enough for any citizen. Our next speaker is a former Trump administration official who worked for the Department of Homeland Security. He recently endorsed former Vice President Joe Biden and recently formed a group dedicated to defeating President Trump in November. Politico reported Monday that Miles Taylor, a former chief of staff at DHS under Trump, as well as two other former DHS officials are behind the new group known as the Republican Political Alliance for Integrity and Reform or Repair. Here's Miles Taylor. When Donald Trump was elected president in 2016, he deserved a shot. Whether Americans voted for him or not, we needed to give the new chief executive a chance to prove himself worthy, worthy of the title and worthy of the opportunity to lead the greatest nation on earth. But after nearly four years, we know enough to reach a firm conclusion. The president proved himself unworthy of both. What's more, Donald Trump showed us that he is actually a danger to our national security at home and abroad. I don't say this lightly, and I also don't say it as a mere observer. I say it as someone who was appointed to serve under this president and spent more than two years helping run the department that he viewed as among the most important in his administration. My name is Miles Taylor. I've spent my career in the national security community focused on keeping Americans safe. I joined the Trump administration where I eventually became chief of staff of the Department of Homeland Security. But I left in 2019 because I could no longer serve this president. I want to tell you why. But first, I want to say something to my fellow Republicans, many of whom believe that the seemingly endless criticism of our president is fake news, that it's a fabrication, uh, fabrication of a deep state or a malicious mainstream media. I helped run the third largest department in the federal government, a 250,000 employee, $60 billion a year organization and I will tell you this, I saw no sign of a deep state dedicated to unseating the president. And when it comes to media coverage, I will admit the Trump administration is not as bad as it's been made out to be. It is worse. It is exactly what we as conservatives have always said government should not be. Wasteful, arbitrary, tumultuous, unpredictable, and prone to abuses of power. Worst of all, it is failing at its most 
fundamental responsibility. The most sacred duty of any president is the duty to protect the country from all enemies, foreign and domestic. It requires a man or woman who is even keeled, sober minded, focused and decisive. In my firsthand experience, Donald Trump was none of these. He was erratic, unserious, unfocused and wildly indecisive. These might be qualities that are okay on the campaign trail, but they aren't qualities that should be displayed behind the resolute desk in the Oval Office of the White House, especially in moments of national crisis. It was also clear to many of us at the most senior levels of this administration that the president was inclined to put his self-interest ahead of the country's interest. For instance, he treated DHS like a political tool meant to help him win re-election rather than the nonpartisan law enforcement agency that it actually is. This was especially true when it came to immigration. Donald Trump is right to care about border security, but his overwhelming obsession with the border and the border wall came at a high cost. It meant the president rarely had time or interest in other pressing threats to the homeland, from terrorists and cyber criminals to hostile foreign governments that are trying to divide and destroy our democracy. Trump didn't care. It was the wall or nothing. As a result, DHS was less focused than it otherwise could have been on protecting Americans. And for several years, our commander in chief has been ill-informed about some of the most serious threats to the United States. Our enemies and adversaries know it. They are exploiting that ignorance. And today we are less safe. To make matters worse, the president has frequently ignored our closest allies and embraced those enemies with open arms trying to cut deals with everyone from Taliban terrorists who har harbored the 9-11 hijackers to Kim Jong-un, North Korea's murderous dictator. As a result today, America has fewer friends and far stronger enemies than when Trump became president. But the consequences in our own communities are where Donald Trump's leadership failures are most evident. I remember one day in 2018 when we tried to brief the president on school safety on important recommendations for how we should use the powers of the federal government to keep America's school children from being murdered in their own classrooms. The president was disinterested and he changed the subject. He wanted to talk about once again, border. And as we sat there holding on to stories from the families of Sandy Hook and Parkland victims, he told us he wanted to tweak the designs of the border walls so it would be quote, a work of art. It was clear that day what was the bigger priority for Donald Trump. The president also directed us to use the powers of DHS to take actions that would benefit him politically or would hurt his detractors, whether it was demands to release illegal aliens on US streets in democratic leaning cities or cutting off emergency aid to Americans in states and territories where he was unpopular. In fact, during some of the worst natural disasters in recent memory, we watched as the president routinely politicized the response and was too distracted to provide the leadership the American people needed to recover. We saw it too with the president's reaction to nationwide civil unrest this summer. He showed greater interest in deploying DHS to protect the statues of Confederate soldiers than to protect the lives of black Americans who still feel in corners of our country that they are treated differently because of the color of their skin. It shouldn't be this way. The Department of Homeland Security was built from the rubble of 9-11. It was charged with preventing such a day from happening again. So we would never have to watch Americans leap from burning buildings or hear the stories about final phone calls of loved ones aboard hijacked airplanes. If Trump had paid more attention, he would have used DHS the way it was meant to be used, including responding earlier to the coronavirus pandemic. DHS was built for that mission. It was ready for that mission. But because he didn't, our economy went into free fall and our country is in turmoil. Because he didn't, we are experiencing the equivalent of a 9-11 scale attack every week with thousands of Americans dying needlessly from the uncontrolled spread of the virus. And because he didn't, we once again have to hear the stories of loved ones making final phone calls, this time alone, from empty hospital rooms where they will leave this earth without their families by their sides. Four more years of this would be unthinkable. As I've said recently, advisors close to the president have told me they are planning for, quote, shock and awe if he gets reelected. Do you know what they mean by that? They mean they want to implement policies that are so unacceptable and so un-American that they can't implement them now 
before the president faces voters. If reelected, Trump will feel emboldened, as he hinted with these words earlier this year. When somebody's president of the United States, he said, the authority is total, and that's the way it's got to be. If reelected, the guardrails will be gone, and Trump will try to remake this country in his own image, an image of division over unity and hate over hope. If you doubt it, look no further than how Trump has already recast America from a shining city upon a hill, a beacon of hope to the world, into a land closed off to those striving for freedom, including aspiring immigrants seeking shelter from storms back home. In fact, his animosity towards migrants is so deep that he implored us to turn them away, tear gas them, and even shoot them at our southern border to prevent them from reaching our country. We're not talking about hardened criminals most of the time. In most cases, we're talking about women and children who are fleeing violence and persecution. He told us directly he wanted his wall to have spikes so sharp that they would cut through human flesh and hot black paint that would burn the skin of anyone who touched it. He even asked us if it could be electrified. This is not a man who wants to secure our country. This is a man who has lost his humanity. So let me say this, Donald Trump's character does not reflect the American character, yet he has managed to divide us and a lot of damage has been done. So it's time for us to ask, what is needed to repair our republic? First, we face an obvious choice on November 3rd. We are going to be called upon to put country over party. To move on from the Trump era, it will mean electing a Democrat with whom we disagree on many issues, but who is a good man and will be a steady leader. As conservatives, it may be hard, but it's the reset we need. Second, we need to repair the Republican Party itself. We need to go back to our roots and restore the vision that was once the GOP, the party that ended slavery, unleashed the motive power of the American economy and defended freedom around the world. And third and most importantly, we need to make repairs closer to home. It's not Washington DC that needs to be fixed the most, it's us. And the changes will begin with each and every American. We need to remember that we're neighbors and not political adversaries, that we're all a part of the greatest experiment in human freedom, an experiment that only worked because we had a thriving civil society and communities that held each other up and held each other close. This isn't a job government can do for us. It's a job we have to do for ourselves. Fortunately, past generations of Americans have lit the way. On the brink of a civil war that literally split our nation in two, Abraham Lincoln called on Americans not to lose sight of one another. He said, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart all over this land will yet swell the chorus of the union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. We should heed his words. Yes, we must return to our founding principles, but first we must return to each other and repair the bonds of affection that make us fellow Americans. Thank you. Let's do this together and may God bless America. Thank you, Miles, for speaking up. And we can only hope that more and more Americans feel empowered and compelled to stand against injustices and indignities that they witness. Miles may be a part of a select group of Trump appointees willing to tell the truth on record, but he's not alone as a dedicated Republican civil servant who is vocally against Trump and Trumpism. I want to welcome Mindy and Heath. And Mindy, I want to go to you first. Why is it so important that public servants have the ability to speak out against things that they may find unethical in the various departments that they work at? Yeah, well, you know, sure, Michael, very often public servants are, are the ones that would be the only ones to kind of witness key operations, key decisions, uh, key deliberations about very important activities of, of the government. And, you know, they are really a, a line of defense and a check on potential wrongdoing. I mean, if there is terrible wrongdoing happening and certainly in our national security apparatus and, and uh, in the institutions throughout the administration that are focused on security, you know, many of those activities are not those that would see 
the light of day, if not for uh, public servants, you know, having at least an opportunity to uh, report wrongdoing and for at some point that wrongdoing to to be made public. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, we just saw Miles, Miles Taylor. Um, you know, I think today we also see other former Trump administration officials at DHS and elsewhere coming out. I expect that we will see more who just feel that it is their civic duty uh, as Americans, as those who have dedicated their lives and are part of their lives and, and parts of their careers to serving this country every single day. You know, they're coming forward and warning the public about the danger to our country, um, to American lives, to the world, if we allow Donald Trump to continue as our leader, um, and certainly as we allow him to continue unchecked. And Heath, before I get your response to that, I, I want to get your thoughts on something you tweeted out on social media, some remarks that Tucker Carlson made on Fox News. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, sure, Michael. I mean, just truly, truly appalling. Uh, you know, Tucker Carlson tonight is really taking away a lot of attention from the RNC because he has once again opted to use his platform to just fuel division in this country. I mean, so it, it, it stems from this entire situation with the 17 year old white man from Illinois uh, that, that crossed state lines and went to Kenosha with, with, with an assault rifle, a, a gun, walking the streets, uh, essentially where he shouldn't be, guns down two people, and has been charged with homicide. And Tucker Carlson, here's a guy who uh, for weeks, months, the last months, as all of this strife has been going through the country, here's a guy that talks about all of the violence, all of the rooting, uh, looting, the rioting, all of this, and then the minute that a white man goes across the state lines, shoots someone down in the streets, Tucker is the first one out there saying, why, why would we expect anything else? When, you know, 17 year old men have to go and take guns and take the law into their own hands. Why aren't we just celebrating this guy? That is appalling, Sir Michael. That gets right at the core of everything we are as conservatives. We, it doesn't matter if you're white or black. The law doesn't see color. And to have Tucker Carlson out there defending this guy, this, the guy that gunned down two people in the streets without waiting for the facts, without waiting for anything to just defend him to his audience on national TV is, is a disgrace to conservatism. It's a disgrace to the American people. And it's just appalling, Sir Michael. I, I, I don't understand what has happened to Fox News, what has happened to the conservative movement, that that is okay. It's not okay. It isn't. And, and Heath, what are your thoughts on Miles and civil servants being able to speak out against corruption? Sure. I mean, Miles has done the country a great service, obviously. I mean, here's a guy who was, you know, part of the administration on, on Team Trump, voted for Trump in 2016, and was really one of the most trusted advisors of, 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 the, of the DHS. Um, and for him to come out and say that the president is completely unfocused on the things that matter to the American people, the things that keep America safe, for him to say that he was uncertain that the president was putting the American people's interests first is really concerning and, and really, quite frankly, frightening um, for, for all of us. We have to have uh, leaders who know what they're doing, who, who take in facts, take in information, sure. and don't govern uh, with, with the latest newsreel right. in their head. Uh, right. And, and so no, I, to I can, have- Heath, I, I completely understand. I hate to cut you off, my friend, uh, but I, I, I do agree with you. And I think what Miles is doing is important and hopefully this is an example to give courage to other individuals within the government. I wanna thank Heath and Mindy, and we'll see you guys later. Make sure you continue to comment on our YouTube page, Facebook page, and Twitter using the hashtag CFP2020. Our next speaker, Anthony Scaramucci, is the founder of Skybridge Capital, and of course, a former Trump administration communications director. I am Anthony Scaramucci, a former White House communications director, but also the founder of Skybridge Capital and an American entrepreneur and a lifelong Republican who uh, deeply loves the country. Uh, principle number 12, free speech 
and the press. They're guaranteed by the Constitution, and they are essential to an accountable government. Uh, we condemn the effort of authoritarian leaders to impede or control the press and to erode public support for its vital role in our system of self-government. We support measures that expand government transparency, and we want to protect the press from government retribution. And so this is a core guiding principle. It's also the First Amendment of our Constitution. And I think our founders made it appropriately the First Amendment, the freedom of protest, the freedom of speech, the freedom to practice the religion of our choice and to separate our religion uh, from the government. All of these things were core to the introduction of the American experiment. And if you sit back and look at it over 244 years, it's arguably some of the main reasons why we have been one of the most successful countries in the history of the world. But I wanna talk specifically about the freedom of the press, because as the former White House communications director, even though it was only for 11 days, uh, the press and free speech and the Constitution are super important to me. And this is one of the main reasons why uh, I am absolutely convinced that Donald Trump should not be our president going forward and that we have to get together as a group. We have to put our patriotism first. Uh, partisanship should be deep last, frankly. And we have to think about the guiding principles of our founders and the guiding principles of the Constitution. Uh, and we need to house the president. And there's several reasons for that. But one of the main ones is him constantly subverting the notion and the idea of the free press, uh, calling out fake news, uh, mentioning at uh, CPAC and other meetings that the press is the enemy of the people or the press is the opposition party. And if there's something in the news cycle that he doesn't like, uh, he does everything he can uh, to hurt and harm the press. And so I wrote an op-ed uh, in April of 2019, which was in the Hill magazine, uh, and it's also available online to demarcate why this is so dangerous. And so uh, core principle number one, when you think about our founding fathers, uh, they put the free press in there because they knew that they wanted to hold the government accountable. Uh, they were rejecting the power structures of Europe and the places that they came from, and they were trying to set up a power structure that was actually quite diffuse. And if you really think about the founders, their core element was to make sure that the people that were put in power uh, were put in power to serve the American people. It's not the other way around. One of the problems that the president has is that he's focused on the idea of ruling as opposed to the idea of serving. And so uh, we need people in that position uh, to think about it from a service capacity, but also to think about it on the point of view of being accountable. And so my first day on the job in the White House, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do from the White House press podium uh, was to sort of have a rapprochement and a peace treaty with the press. I thought that the war with the press was totally unnecessary. Uh, granted that the press is not always going to be favorable. Oftentimes, uh, whether it's a Democratic administration or a Republican min administration, frankly, they are unfavorable. They say mean and nasty things about all people in power, uh, but the people in power shouldn't be thin-skinned or lack uh, self-confidence or security uh, to be able to accept that. They should be able to roll with it. But unfortunately, the president is not capable of doing that. President Trump is constantly in this vitriolic battle with the press, and he's trying to pit the press against a core group of the American people and to make the American people think uh, that the press is being unfair or not objective. Now, I accept that there has been liberal biases in the media. Certainly, there are certain news organizations that are very conservative, but there's been a liberal bias in the media for a good swath of the American media, but I think my central message to people is, who cares? Uh, if you're in that seat of power and you've been bestowed uh, through God's grace and the American electorate the opportunity to serve at the highest level of public service, the American presidency, you should be rising above that stuff. And you should be willing to hold your administration accountable to the American people through the vehicle of the press. And so, uh, I think this is super important for the country. It is super important for our children. And frankly, it's super important for our standing in the world because it contrasts directly 
uh, from autocratic and totalitarianism. And so uh, one of the things I tell younger people when I'm out lecturing uh, is that the free press not only provides a check on our liberty and sort of that fourth state, if you will, that fourth uh, check and balance in the system, but it also creates this great opportunity for economic innovation and creative thinking. As so I just imagine when we're telling our second grade students that they have the freedom of speech and they can talk about anything that they want. They could, if necessary, denigrate or criticize their government. Uh, in other countries, uh, some of the totalitarian regimes, as we know, they're not allowed to do that. They can't speak negatively about the government. Two thirds of the internet is sometimes censored in some of these areas of the world. And lo and behold, as these children grow up, they grow up narrow-minded, they grow up narrow-banded from a creative perspective. Uh, and there is a central reason why things like Facebook and Apple Computer and Amazon and Snapchat, all of these great American companies are developed here in America through the creative entrepreneurial spirit of Americans. And a lot of that has to do with the freedom of the press. Uh, we tell younger people that they can speak freely. They go on and they create and they innovate. Uh, other countries uh, have to steal our intellectual property, frankly, because they don't have that opportunity in their lands. And so uh, what I fear, and one of the main reasons why in August of 2019, I denounced what the president was doing and I withdrew my support uh, and suggested that we needed to replace the president and possibly rebuild the Republican Party uh, is that the president has taken a very demagogic stance to these things. Uh, and what do demagogues typically do? They distort the reality around them. They distort the truth. Uh, and they say things in an exaggerated, often non-factual way uh, to draw their acolytes and to draw their supporters in place. And then the other thing that they do is through the bellicosity of bullying, uh, they intimidate their opponents uh, from standing uh, and, and rebuking them. And so this is a very, very dangerous thing in America. It has happened in the past. It happened during the Joe McCarthy era, but it never really happened at the level of the office of the presidency. And so uh, I am super proud uh, to be here before you to talk about these issues and to talk about how important these issues are for the American people. And so guiding principle number 12, uh, the freedom of the press supporting uh, journalism. Uh, it doesn't matter what side of the spectrum there are. It doesn't matter the opinion of the journalist. What it matters is the integrity of the system and the integrity of our freedoms. Uh, and we'll let our citizens, we'll let our great citizens through their own impartiality or their biases for that matter to make their own decisions. And so, so I'm very, very proud to uh, talk about this with you and to stand here uh, as somebody that stood at the White House press podium uh, and reached out an olive branch to the American press and the international press uh, to speak about the First Amendment and that system of accountability that we need to preserve. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Anthony Scaramucci. And I want to bring in Brad and Reed to talk a little bit about social media, some of your comments on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Brad, I want to go to you first. What are people saying in the social media world? You know, uh, we just heard Anthony Scaramucci talk about his favorite founding principle. And so I thought it was so important to talk about what what principles people are, are speaking about on YouTube and on Facebook and on Twitter. And so I want to shout out um, Stephen Nielsen, who talked about his favorite uh, principle is principle number two, uh, which is the rule of law according to the consent of the governed, uh, which means this is not a dictatorship. The moment that the American citizens understand uh, that their leadership is not doing for them what they need from them, they have the right to remove that leadership. And I think that's such an important principle as we're, that, that we're looking at as we're moving into talking about this election season. Reed? Yeah, and you know, people really enjoyed Miles Taylor's speech, the principled stand that he took. Jonia Broderick on Twitter um, pulled a quote and she said, we must return to our founding principles, but first we need to return to each other. And so there's this real spirit out there that the only way that we're gonna be able to to heal the country is by coming together and, and people are picking that up because it's a theme running throughout the convention tonight. And did you guys find any other more interesting comments uh, about our convention, comparing our convention perhaps to what's going on 
with Republicans right now, mostly in D.C. I'm curious to know what people think. Yeah, definitely. Susan Ray on Facebook said, as an independent, I am so glad to hear reasonable voices, adult discourse, and honest conversation. This gives me a little hope for the future of our country. And sure, Michael, as we're here talking about principles, I think we should say that it's not that we're squishy and that we don't stand for anything. In fact, it's because we do stand for something. And when we talk about consensus and moving forward with hope and unity, it's not a call for no fighting. It's a call for more meaningful fighting. And that is severely missing both in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party right now. Hopefully this movement can cross the partisan divide and restore a level of decency to our rhetoric and our politics. And Brad, I know you also had a, a few other comments from YouTube or Facebook. Uh, let's let's hear some of those. You know, really, I'd just like to sum up uh, all of the outpouring of support and continue the idea that, that Reed just talked about, uh, where people are really looking for meaningful discourse. Over the past couple of days, I've had uh, an outpouring of people in my inbox, my DMs. I have people reach out to me on LinkedIn, on, on a bunch of different platforms, really to say that they appreciate that there, there are people who are standing up uh, for true principles and values in this country. And they're looking for real, meaningful discourse, and they're so excited to be a part of that. And so I'd like to encourage for everyone to continue that conversation uh, on all of our social media spaces, on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter as well. Thank you guys for coming out. And remember, it's hashtag CFP2020. So, Reed, I want to go to you. What do you think, based on some of the comments we've heard thus far, what do you think people out there are looking for? Well, you know, I think they're really looking for people to stand up now when it's not convenient. And I just have to say, sure, Michael, that right now, Madison Cawthorn is taking the stage at the Republican National Convention. He and I are the same age. And I just have a message for Madison. You have ta he's taken the rosy road. He's taken the road of least resistance. It is political expediency over compassionate conservatism. It is, um, it, there's nothing principled about it. And the future belongs to those of us who are gonna stand up now in this election and say enough is enough. We cannot continue down the path that Donald Trump has laid out. And that's what I think people wanna see most. They are desperate for bold leadership. And that's what the principled conservatives that you hear tonight throughout this convention represent. And we are the ones, the agitators of the status quo, who are gonna have the moral legitimacy and moral clarity to lead whatever comes next. And, and Reed, I wanna stick with this a little bit because I think this is very fascinating. His opponent, Mo Davis, is a retired military lawyer and judge who was a prosecutor at Guantanamo Bay, but spoke out against torture. Now we know when Donald Trump was a candidate, Reed and Brad, he stated he does not like individuals who are captured. So Brad, I wanna to go to you. What do you think that, that says about the type of candidates that the Republican party is elevating to, to power and leadership? You know, it's like, like, like so many people have talked about before, uh, it's, it's, it's built around this kind of cult of personality, this idea uh, that as long as you just uh, lift up whatever I'm doing at the time, that's okay. And I'm, I'm very proud to be on the side uh, that takes a principled stand. I'm very proud to be on the side uh, that respects those who have served in our military, uh, regardless of whether or not they were captured, they've given the ultimate sacrifice uh, so that you and I are able to able, even able to have these conversations, even though we might be thousands of miles away, they've been thousands of miles further uh, putting themselves in, in, in harm's danger, in harm's way, uh, making sure that we have those freedoms. I mean, we want to make sure that we do them, that we do them justice, that we're standing here and making Making a principled stand, uh, not just for today, uh, but for, for future generations as well. I think you're absolutely right, Brad. And again, guys, you have to make sure you comment on YouTube, comment on Facebook, continue to tweet hashtag CFP2020. We want to continue to engage with you. We want to continue to read your comments aloud. I'm having such a great time with Brad and Reed. I think I'm going to call the three of us the bros. So the <laughs> bros will be back momentarily. You might know our next speaker from her show on CNN. And if you, like me, are a fan of SE Cup, then you know she's passionate about refugee resettlement and humanitarian aid, both of which are languishing in the Trump era. Tonight, she lays out the cases for a compassionate conservatism that defends the vulnerable and welcome refugees. Hello, I'm Essie Cup, and it's an honor to address you today. 
My job as a CNN host and columnist at the New York Daily News is to offer my opinion about American politics. For nearly two decades, that's what I've done in various capacities over multiple administrations. And don't get me wrong, covering American politics is exciting. I've had a seat on the front row of history. Stakes are always high, there are always stories that matter, and it can be a contact sport. Believe me, I know. And it's a full-time job, but there are so many stories that don't get as much attention that aren't featured in the steady diet of domestic politics. So my side hustle has been to tell the often untold stories of what I like to call over there. That's how we describe whatever's happening in the rest of the world, right? Especially in places where the people don't look like us. We say, well, that's happening over there. For me, that's meant traveling to the Maghreb to tell the stories of the Sahrawi people who've been locked in a permanent state of limbo in a sparsely populated disputed territory in Northwest Africa, or covering the ongoing plight of the Yazidis in Iraq or the Rohingya in Myanmar. And for years, too many of them in fact, you might have heard me speak about the Syrian war, a genocide of over half a million innocent Syrians. Now that conflict hit me harder than most. I'm a mom and it's a war that's resulted in the murder of more than 50,000 children, sometimes by gruesome chemical weapons attacks. Thousands more have been tortured or injured by barrel bombs. Many have been imprisoned, never to be heard from again by their families. And countless more are homeless, wandering from camp to camp just to avoid being killed by their own government. Worse, it's unfolded before our very eyes. We are the first generation to watch a genocide happen in real time with a constant stream of video and social media, and we've done shockingly little to stop it. Now, in talking about all of this, I've learned that it's very hard to tell the stories of over there because we are understandably overwhelmed by what's happening right here. There is struggle, trial, injustice, and oppression happening in our own backyards. It's enough to deal with. In fact, it's more than enough. But here's the thing, what happens over there doesn't always stay over there. So when I talk about war or genocide or human rights abuses, terrorism and other crises abroad, it's often because there are very real consequences for the rest of the world, including the United States. Terrorism outbreaks over there have come to our shores, as we all know. Civil unrest in places like Yemen can have very real national security consequences for us when we pick sides and arm them. There are tangible costs to our involvement or lack of involvement in foreign theaters, billions of our taxpayer dollars that could be well spent or poorly spent either on defense or aid. There are intangible costs to our actions and inactions too. What the United States does about injustices abroad can affect our moral authority and influence to change the world for the better or hold other governments to account. Nowhere is that more evidenced than in the plight of refugees around the world. The story of refugees is not just a story of over there, it's an American story and one that deeply impacts us. Now there are good stories and there are very troubling stories, urgent stories that need our attention. What's happening to some refugee populations around the world is nothing short of tragic. The genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar is just one of those tragic stories. The Rohingya are one of the most persecuted ethnic minorities in the world. More than 900,000 have fled Myanmar to Bangladesh and other neighborhood countries with untold numbers slaughtered, tortured, and raped. This travesty is ongoing, happening now. As is the displacement of millions of Syrians. The humanitarian concerns there are many. For example, there are currently more Syrians living outside of Syria than inside of it. Many are in refugee camps in Jordan or Turkey with limited resources. Things like food and medical supplies are a daily fight. And for a generation of children, there's been no school for years. To put this in perspective, Sesame Street, the U.S. public television program that entertained and educated so many of us, is creating a new program just for Syria's children to help address the lasting trauma they have been facing for a decade. These children should matter. They deserve our help. 
beyond the humanitarian impact of refugee crises, there are national security implications as well. Often where there are IDPs or internally displaced persons or where there are refugees, there are dangerous power vacuums that open the door for very bad actors to fill. We ignore those power vacuums at our own peril. Those tragedies are what happens when <clears throat> the world does nothing for refugees. But we also get the good stories, the incredible stories of refugees when we do act. Here in the United States, our long history of welcoming refugees has not only made us who we are, defined our democracy and the American dream, but it's also been really good for us. Don't take my word for it. In a 2019 letter from U.S. generals to the Trump administration on the importance of refugee resettlement, national security, they write that refugee resettlement offers invaluable and concrete support to our allies. Giving safe haven to the most vulnerable refugees, those that can't be safe in their countries, shows our humanitarian leadership. They write that it supports regional stability by preventing a return back to war-torn countries. It bolsters national security missions overseas. And the successful integration of refugees, including those who served along U.S. troops, supports our domestic infrastructure as well. The resettlement of refugees in the United States helps us carry out foreign policy objectives, helps strengthen our intelligence and national security communities too. Refugees are also very good for our economy. They give back. They start working as soon as they can. They pay taxes. They start businesses. They become active members of society. In 2018, the average workforce participation rate among refugees was 81.8%. That's above the national average of 62%. The U.S. refugee and asylee population paid $63 billion more in taxes than they received in government benefits from 2005 to 2014. And they give back in more ways than one. Consider Abdul Hamid, a Rohingya refugee who resettled in the U.S. in 2015. Today, he lives with his wife and children in Milwaukee, where he works as a full-time medical interpreter for the Rohingya and Burmese community at St. Luke's Medical Center. In fact, the U.S. is home to an estimated 176,000 refugee healthcare workers. They are serving on the front lines of COVID as doctors, nurses, and medical personnel. Lubab al Qureshi, trained as a doctor in Iraq, now she works in northern New Jersey and New York City as a pathology assistant, testing older adults for COVID. Another 175,000 resettled refugees in America work in the food supply chain. In fact, they make up 30% of all workers in South Dakota's meatpacking industry, another important frontline job in the era of COVID. All of these are reasons to help support and invest in refugees. They are our neighbors. And in some cases, they are even our heroes. And yet we're facing the worst refugee crisis in recorded history. An unprecedented 79.5 million people worldwide have been forced from their homes, of which 29.6 million are refugees, half of whom are children. No one wants to be a refugee. It's often the last resort, and the hurdles are immense. To be considered for resettlement, a refugee must receive refugee status by the United Nations Refugee Agency. By proving they are fleeing persecution based on their ethnicity, nationality, religion, political opinion, or social group. They must be at risk for further harm and meet additional criteria, like being a survivor of violence or torture. The resettlement program is nothing less than life-saving. Now, it cannot accommodate every refugee, but it must accommodate the most vulnerable, at the very least. Since the creation of the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, the U.S. has set a goal of 95,000 refugees a year. We resettled only 30,000 in 2019, and this year, due to an even lower ceiling of 18,000 and a temporary halt due to COVID, only 7,850 have been resettled. The refugee crisis around the world doesn't stop for a pandemic or politics, it just worsens. Now, here at this Convention on Founding Principles, as we offer a counter vision for conservatives, I'm reminded of why I became a conservative in the first place. Sure, it was taxes and national defense and limited government, but it was also our compassionate conservatism that had offered a beacon of hope for so many around the world. It was the compassionate conservatism that guided 
Ronald Reagan in his steadfast opposition to communism in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. It was the compassionate conservatism that guided George H.W. Bush's support of German reunification. It guided George W. Bush in combating AIDS and HIV in Africa. It's in the longtime conservative policies that support Israel, Cuban and Vietnamese refugees, Coptic Christians, and other oppressed, persecuted groups. We are at our best when we are compassionate, especially when it comes to what's happening over there. As conservatives, we are defined not only by the people we stand up against, but the people we stand up for. Marginalizing and demonizing refugees is not conservative. It isn't principled. It's purely political. And it not only hurts refugees, but it hurts America and Americans. The choices are pretty clear. We know what happens when no one stands up for refugees. They suffer, we suffer. And we know what happens when we do stand up for refugees. They thrive, we thrive. So if you can, please take a moment to learn more about the U.S. refugee resettlement policy. Consider supporting tremendous refugee advocates like my friends at Refugees International and Inara.org. Your support matters over there and right here. Thank you and continue to fight the good fight. Thanks, Essie. Our next speaker is a co-founder of the Lincoln Project and a Republican political consultant. Here's Mike Madrid. A warm California greeting to all the delegates and attendees in, uh, with us tonight. My name is Mike Madrid. I'm here today to speak to you as an American, as a conservative, and as a Hispanic, grandson of immigrants from both Mexico and New Mexico. And it's my honor to be with you talking about what has really been the passion and the work of my lifetime. Over the course of the past three decades, growing up in the Southwest, I've seen firsthand the demographic changes that are really a precursor of what is likely to change America. America is changing. We're fundamentally gonna be a different people, a different complexion, a different look, previous and different than any other generation in the history of our country. In fact, for the vast majority of you, those changes may be a little bit disruptive. This will be the first generation of Americans born of European ancestry, a majority of this country, leaving an America to a majority of non-European ancestry. This challenge is not only an American challenge, it's a conservative challenge. And specifically, it's a challenge to our Republican Party. To many of you younger listeners, this probably doesn't strike you as very odd. It's the America you have always known. But to some of our older listeners, this might sound like a loss of epic proportions. And yes, while America has cha is changing, we have always changed. Our strength has been found in remaining constant, not in not remaining constant, rather, in not remaining stagnant, in not being flat. Our dynamism is that strength. And our resiliency is a product of that change. But one thing that is unchanging and is always unchanged has been our principles, our core values, the ability to stay true to the ideals of our founders, ideas of what we could be, although maybe that wasn't always the reality, and what we aspired to be. Through social change, through global depressions, through world wars, and even through pandemic. It's always been part of the American character to adapt to societal changes while holding true to our principles and our values. And foundational to that, of course, is the idea that our rights, our inalienable rights, our God-given rights are bestowed upon every one of us, all of us equally as children of God. Ronald Reagan spoke to us about that shining city on a hill being a magnet for all peoples coming to this country. But remember that when he was talking about that city, he talked about it being on rocks stronger than oceans, wind swept, God blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. And he referenced most specifically the fact that if there had to be walls around that city, the walls would have doors, and those doors were opened to anyone 
with the will and the hearts to get here. The immigrant story, the story of the refugee is the American story. Not simply because it's good mythology or a good narrative about who we are, but in many ways, it's the immigrant experience, those looking for a better life that reinvigorate the American dream, that add a new energy for a new generation of Americans to remind those that have been here who we are, who we aspire to be, and what our aspirations must continue to be as Americans to continue this American experiment. Why then do so many of our fellow Americans fear the immigrant? Why do so many deny the refugee? When did we lose confidence in ourselves as conservatives and as Americans that we believed it possible to lose our freedom, our principles, our values, to those desperately seeking to be like us, to be American. Why is this generation of Americans so fearful when those that preceded it were so strong? I'm reminded, of course, of Abraham Lincoln, who 160 years ago, this year, in a speech at Cooper Union in New York City, launched the Republican Party, launched a man in his presidency, and a cause and a social movement that changed the world. The Republican Party, in many ways, was the first political party in the United States formed for racial justice. Racial justice was our founding principle. The Republican Party was literally created to say that Black equality mattered, the pursuit of happiness mattered, that for Blacks, liberty mattered, that Black lives mattered. That is our founding. That is our principle. That is our core. And foundationally and fundamentally, the essence of that speech that launched the Republican Party as a national force that changed the course of history was about the idea that it is right. What is morally right is what makes for might. And I question today if the conservative movement and the Republican Party share that same common commitment. Make no mistake, friends, we are at a moment where conservatism and republicanism are at a loggerheads. They are no longer defined under the umbrella of the same party. It is principle that must guide us. It is the values we must return to. The spirit, the optimism, and the, the God-given bestowed rights of who we are as a people that must guide us. The roadmap is clear. We've had them for 244 years. Let us recommit to that. Let us recommit to that principle. Let us focus again, focus again on being a party of Lincoln, a party of equality, a party of values, a party of justice, and a party of principle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. And Evan and Reed, I want to bring you guys back in to be a part of this conversation. And Evan, I want to go to you first. Mike talked about the importance of demographic changes, and demography obviously is going to change and impact the electoral maps in ways that we haven't seen in, in a very long time. And it appears that the Republican Party is going to be at some level of a disadvantage as it pertains to its ability to target and outreach and mobilize minorities. That's right, Sir Michael. And as, as Mike said, you know, the, de the demographics in our country are changing. It's just a reality. And anytime that happens in a country, it's not unusual for there to be anxiety among the group of people, the, the, the ethnicity of people, the race of people who previously enjoyed a strong majority. So that anxiety exists in the United States. And what the Republican Party has decided to do, however, is instead of uh, leading its, its base and it, it, the party itself through that demographic change, remaining committed to its values, it's decided to represent and even stoke that anxiety, making things worse. Now, I'll tell you, that's the easiest thing for a politician to do is to take someone's fears or anxieties and just stoke them and make them worse and then present themselves as the person who's going to do something about it. But the reality is that's not going to change the demographic change in the United States. It's happening. It's a fact. And right now, the, the, the Republican Party generally wins about 10 percent of the African-American vote, and it, it generally performs terribly with minorities in general. And that's just got to change. And it needs to recommit itself to its values. As our principle eight says, our, our country is defined by its ideals. 
And if we go back to that definition as a party our, uh, ourselves, as, as a party defining you know, what we think America is, that sets us up for you know, winning more votes from a variety of, of uh, groups in Americans, minorities and, and others who care about the, the situation for minorities in America. And, and Reed, to you next, what do you think is going to take for the Republican Party to attract African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, uh, members of the LGBTQA community? What is it gonna take to get the party to recognize that it has to become a big tent party in order to be competitive in the future? Well, you know, I think we're already seeing it now how Republicans are not speaking to these communities. And of course, when you hear some of the comments that come out of Donald Trump's mouth, um, he is not encouraging folks to come to the party because we're not showing that we care about them. But Shermichael, I wanna say another thing. In addition to, uh, we just need to be, um, use our principles as the bedrock of our policies because our principles really do talk about an inclusive America. What does that mean? That means expanding education access for all. It means eliminating poverty. It means re conservatives want to reduce barriers to success, whether they're installed by government, by bureaucracy, or by human systems like societal injustice. So once we begin to talk about those issues, about making voting easier and more accessible for everyone, we're gonna begin to attract um, more folks to our party. And I'll say this one last thing, Shermichael. Um, right now I'm coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia, where Brian Kemp, a Republican, overwhelmingly targeted black districts and precincts to purge voting rolls. And so if we're telling people we don't want them to vote, of course, they're not going to think that we care about them. So we've got to change all of those things and show people that we're here for them on policy as much as we are in rhetoric. Evan, I want to ask you this question. There are a lot of voters who are coming of age in the era of Trump. And everything that they associate as negative with Donald Trump, they will associate as being tied to the Republican Party. Are those things, can those things ever change? Do you think it's too late to change those things? And if so, should conservatives start to look for a new party, perhaps creating something new? Sure, Michael, I don't know the answer to that question. It's very difficult to, to start a new party in America. We're not like European systems where, you know, they're multi-party systems and parties rise and fall all the time and are created and destroyed. And it just, it's a, you know, that's the norm there that the systems allow for that more easily. Uh, in our system, the way it is now, it's extremely difficult to start a new party and have it be competitive. I think there are chances to do it at the state level. Even that's extremely difficult. And so the, you know, the bigger question of whether the Republican Party can change, can reform in the ways that, that Reid was describing. And I agree with what Reid said. He's absolutely right. I mean, my goodness, if you're going to make it hard for African-Americans to vote as a political strategy, what do you expect them to do when they do vote? Of course, they're not going to be with you. I mean, it's just, and there's so many other issues. Education is another one he mentioned. You know, I think that it's possible that the Republican Party could reform, could return to its founding values and, and, and therefore offer better leadership to the country. But I think it's going to be very difficult for that to happen after what I've seen over the last decade it's going to be very difficult for that to happen uh, on its own. I think, unfortunately, the Republican Party will have to suffer some defeats, maybe multiple cycles of defeats, before it decides, yes, we've got to do something different and leaders step in to help that, that bold change happen. So it's, it's possible, but extremely difficult. And, you know, you point out the new people who are joining the party now. You know, one of the things I love about my work these days with Stand Up Republic the most is speaking to students. And I have to tell you, when I engage with many Republican students who are with the president in universities and high schools around the country, uh, their view of what conservatism is, is nothing like, the, like what our view of it is. It's not driven by principle. It's driven by loyalty to the, to the president. It's driven by a view of America that it's, it should be defined by its religion and its race. It's, and and it, as long as the, the new blood in the party thinks that way, it's going to be very, very difficult for things to change. Now, I think, 
a, a strong leadership and, and maybe some rounds of electoral defeat, you know, sadly, for, for, for the party, but good for the country if this is the way the party is, uh, may be required. But, but other than that, I'm just not, I think it's pretty difficult for it to happen anytime soon. Yeah, Evan, I think that's a million dollar question. And Reed, our producer, tells us that YouTube, they love you, my friend, and they love your responses. <laughs> I want to say thank you so much to Evan and Reed. And our next speaker knows a little thing or two about leadership and service. He's the founder of Vets for Responsible Leadership. Here's Dan Barkov. <laughs> Good evening, folks. Thank you for having me. My name is Daniel Barkoff. I'm an ex-Navy SEAL, currently an emergency room physician and the founder of Veterans for Responsible Leadership. Since Al-Qaeda, terrorist teams hijacked four commercial jets and flew them into national landmarks almost 20 years ago, we as a nation have sought to both punish those responsible and to ensure this would never, ever happen again. The initial invasion of Afghanistan in October 2001 led to a democratically elected government the rout of Al-Qaeda and the denial of Afghanistan as a base of operations for radical Islamic terrorism that threatened not just Americans abroad, but here at home as well. The cost has been over 2,300 American lives. Those who bled out in the dust of the Korangal Valley or evaporated in an IED outside Kaust or crashed into a parched plain near Kandahar are gone now, forever. They came home, what was left of them, in aluminum caskets draped with the American flag. They came home to an honor guard in Dover, Delaware, to a little graveyard in Littleton, Colorado, Annapolis, Maryland, or Douglas, Wyoming. In one sense, their lives were taken from us. The Taliban, Al-Qaeda, the Haqqani network, they took them, they took these lives. But in another much more profound, meaningful way, they gave their lives to us. What occurred, their loss was a gift a final gift. The gift was a chance to live a life worthy of their sacrifice, a life of which they would be proud, a life which they would say to us when we meet our maker is in a small way rooted in the same values of courage, decency, and truth, the very principles that led them to give this last full measure. In the incredible context of such a sacrifice, it can feel trite to discuss politics. We would be right to say these men and women did not die for baseball and apple pie, but rather that they died literally for their brothers and sisters in arms. It is not trite to vow that we, as a nation, will redouble our efforts to protect our men and women in uniform and destroy the enemies who would bring violence to our shores, as they have done on occasion and attempted many, many times. And so now, with a commander in chief so solipsistic, he sees men and women in uniforms only as props. The affairs of this polis, our polis, require us to be political, to ask ourselves, does our current national leadership live up to the awesome responsibility we have entrusted them with? To defend us while simultaneously spending the lives of our sons and daughters in uniform as cheaply, miserly, and as only as necessarily as possible. Donald Trump and his inner circle have known for months that Russian intelligence operatives had been willing to pay $100,000 for a dead American serviceman. It was in his presidential daily brief. It's been reported numerous times by credible news sources after being confirmed by credible sources inside our national intelligence apparatus. Ignorance cannot be an excuse for this coward any longer. Donald Trump has not brought up bounties on US troops with a man responsible for them on literally dozens of occasions. He's feigned ignorance like a child with his hand in a cookie jar until he could no longer do so and then questioned his own intelligence agencies and taken the word of a dictator strongman and former KGB agent, let's not forget, as gospel. Again, he believes the Russians and the Taliban's false assertions over his own intelligence professionals. There are only two possible explanations for this behavior, cowardice or willful neglect rooted in complicity. The military teaches leadership from the very second a new recruit is sworn in. It's the only human trait that can induce warriors to disregard their personal interest and act in the best interest of the team. American soldiers win in combat because they put personal interest and safety aside, 
for the collective, collective interest and the safety of the group. For men at arms, it has always been thus. Donald Trump shares no such ability or interest in collective safety or achievement. We are, all of us, little more than props in his personal fantasy, mere mirrors to hold up to his visage and reflect in his glory. What kind of man, let alone a commander in chief, would allow others in his charge to be killed in a war zone for cash by an enemy without attempting to stop it? What kind of man shies away from something like this? The men and women who have served in Afghanistan represent a small slice of the best of America. They come from everywhere. They come from here. They come from us. Donald Trump is actively betraying them through his inaction. He's a coward. While the men and women walking foot patrols in the Koust Bowl or flying 60s into hot LZs are anything but. We owe it to them. We owe it to them to remove this coward from office. There is no other choice, or we too are cowards or complicit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. And making her live debut is Mariana. And of course, Brad is joining us without his better half, Reed. <laughs> Welcome, guys. So, Mariana, what exactly is going on at the RNC convention? Brad, we'll go to you. Go ahead, Brad. Uh, yeah, so recently uh, we've we've gotten news that uh, that Dan Crenshaw actually just spoke at the RNC, and it's quite interesting to kind of juxtapose him against our our, our previous speaker. Uh, and I think it's right. very interesting also to note that they mentioned he did not mention Trump at all. He did not mention Trump once. And so we're talking about someone who has military experience uh, and also who knows what it means to recognize a leader. And I think that it speaks volumes that even Dan Crenshaw, who's been a vocal supporter of Trump uh, on Twitter and in other spaces, didn't even mention him at the RNC. Right. And Mariana, what do you think that means? The fact that this is someone who the president clearly likes, otherwise he wouldn't have been invited to speak. He'd never even mentioned the guy's name. I'm sure Trump can't be too happy about that. I'm sure he's not. But the reality is, is that Trump's support from military members is slowly eroding. And that was very clear tonight when Representative Crenshaw did not mention Trump's name once in his speech at the RNC. And why do you think that support is eroding? Well, from Russian bounties on soldiers' heads, Trump flip-flopping from not seeing the brief to not knowing, he's just constantly passing the buck. He's not supporting our troops at home or abroad, and that's a problem for any military service member and their family. And so we know that the Vice President, uh, Mike Pence, is headlining. He's the big speaker tonight. Brad, what do you think Pence is going to say that may potentially differ from Trump? Because obviously both men are very disparate in their approach. Uh, to be honest, I think that what we can see from Pence is an appeal to uh, what we would call the evangelical right. That's kind of been his bread and butter for so long, and I don't really see uh, any reason for him to stray from that. Uh, he was, quite frankly, the attempt at a velvet glove on what was the iron fist of Donald Trump. Uh, and I think they're going to continue to go back to that playbook. And so, Mariana, you talked a little bit about support eroding with veterans. What do you think about evangelicals? For the most part, they seem to be really tied in supporting this president all the way until November. You know, this week we've heard some evangelicals who've talked about how they no longer support the president. And the only thing I can hope for is that his support among evangelicals also erodes when it really matters on November 3rd. But, but do you think that's likely though? I mean, I, I think there's been a lot of different impressions, if you will, out there. And I think a lot of people have sort of gotten it wrong. I agree. I think that they have gotten it wrong. And as much as I'd love to stand here and be the optimistic voice and say that his support <laughs> among evangelical supporters will erode and it will cost him dearly in November, I don't have my magic eight ball or my crystal ball to peer into this evening. But what I do know is that it's more important than ever because we just hit a milestone again with COVID, 180,000 deaths and people are still supporting the president. What is going to have to give in order for them to turn their backs on him? And, and Brad, I want to talk a little bit about what Mariana just, just mentioned, right? We, we know COVID-19 is wreaking havoc across this country. Uh, we just heard from Dan Barkov about the importance of, of leadership. Uh, one of the core principles of his organization's principles, civility, those are all the things that we see missing from Donald Trump. And yet his support continues to be around 90% with Republican voters. Why is that? Why are those individuals supporting this president instead of watching us tonight, talking about moving this country forward with real solutions, substantive policy positions. 
Uh, you know, it's really easy to say everyone loved your party when you keep kicking people out of your party, right? Eventually, everyone in the room is just going to agree with you uh, by de facto, right? Um, and and I think what we've what we've talked about is support has been eroding. Just because your support is ninety percent among Republicans, that pool of Republicans we've seen has gotten smaller and smaller year after year. Uh, and I think that that's that's going to be very difficult for him to overcome uh, in the fall. But again, I'm like Mariana, I do not have a crystal ball. I do not have the magic eight ball. I have no idea. Look, I wish we did have a magic eight ball, but I guess, guys, that's the million dollar question. Mariana and Brad. Mariana, I, we got to see more of you. We need you to come back and be a part of the conversation. I would Before love to. Yes. Our, absolutely. Before we go to our next speaker, I want to ask you all this question Why is America's role in the world important to you? Comment on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter using the hashtag CFP2020, and we will read some of your responses live on the show. Our next speaker is a CNN political commentator, former representative from Pennsylvania's 15th Congressional District, and the former chair of the House Ethics Committee. Here's former Congressman Charlie Dent. Hello, I'm Charlie Dent, a former congressman uh, from Pennsylvania's 15th District, which included the Lehigh Valley and extending out as far as Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, currently, I'm a senior policy advisor at the international law firm of DLA Piper, and I'm a political contributor for CNN. Today, I want to have a conversation about a beacon of liberty and what that means. You know, it often seems that over the years that presidents of the United States have often talked about freedom and democracy, and it almost became cliche. You would see them speaking about this uh, routinely. And it almost uh, was ex exhausting at times, but now I think more than ever, I understand why they spoke about it at such great length. And they did so because so many people from around the world do see the United States of America as a beacon of liberty, of freedom, of opportunity. Uh, and it's important that the President of the United States make that point repeatedly. And we've seen that in recent years, that has not been the case uh, when the President uh, has been talking quite a bit about, uh, you know, in, in admiring ways about uh, dictators, about autocrats, whether it be Vladimir Putin or, or, or President Erdogan uh, in, in Turkey, or you know, bromances with Kim Jong Un, uh, or speaking admiringly of President Xi in China. I mean, we begin to question. Many people around the world begin to question America's commitment uh, to liberty, and. Why it's important is that the United States has established a system uh, of alliances and partnerships and free trade agreements that have enhanced our strategic position in the world uh, militarily, as well as our economic position. Uh, and those two things, that, that economic and military relationship, are very much uh, uh, interrelated. Uh, as an example, we have used, the United States has very effectively used multilateral organizations over the years, uh, say NATO, for example, to help advance our national interests, in this case, our national security interests. And that's a very good thing. Uh, you know, there was a, a trade agreement called the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the TPP uh, that meant to align the United States and our Pacific Rim allies uh, economically. We're going to be aligned economically so that we could write the rules and set the standards of trade together. The American leadership uh, to do that. We were doing this so that the Chinese would not end up, end up setting the standards or writing rules. And of course, the United States has withdrawn uh, from the Trans Pacific Partnership. The point I'm making is we can be smart about using our, our alliances, our relationships to advance our interests. And that's what separates the United States uh, from many of the countries that we uh, see as threats or rivals. The, Russia, the Russians really don't have allies, uh, really, nor do the Chinese, for that matter. So it's up to us uh, to enhance uh, those relationships. We, do, we enhance those relationships by partnering with com countries that share our values, as well as our mission, but sharing our values, commitments to uh, democracy, uh, free speech, uh, an independent judiciary, uh, free press, all those necessary prerequisites uh, for democratic societies. And that is what strengthens our relationships and our alliances, those shared values uh, that also translate, in many cases, into shared interests.
So that's something I want to point out. And I would also point out, too, uh, that in the United States, you know, in our, in our, from our national security perspective, you know, we have extraordinary diplomats, uh, and of course, the greatest military in the world, and development assistance programs. And I've often said that, you know, we need to do all three of these things right. Diplomacy, defense, development, uh, to, to, to really advance our interests. And we need to strike uh, that proper balance. And we have not always, we have not always done that. Sometimes we have used our military uh, relied on our military too much to advance maybe diplomatic or even development initiatives. And I think we've got to uh, uh, better reset this. Uh, but bottom line is, this country, you know, is the beacon of liberty, of hope to so many people throughout the world. Even during these troubled times, people still want to come to America once the pandemic passes, of course. Uh, you know, we this is the place where people want to be. There's something special about this place something that is exceptional. And it is up to all of us to make sure that we maintain that spirit of optimism, uh, a nation that is forward leaning, uh, that really has its best days in front of it and does not dwell on, on a past that uh, no longer uh, exists, that we have to talk about the future and, and embrace it uh, and talk about things like I I inclusion and in, in the political sense I've always said, you know, to be a winning or governing coalition, you have to have a, a, a message for the future. You have to be optimistic. You have to be inclusive. You have to talk about adding people, not dividing. Uh, and I think that is something that we have lost. And as a Republican, I'm, I'm deeply troubled uh, by this inward, inward looking, unilateralist, almost protectionist, isolationist, and at times nativist approach uh, to the uh, governing of philosophy. Uh, for our party and ultimately uh, for our country. So we need to get to a better place. And uh, you know, and as a Republican, I hope that at some point, you know, we'll be able to become uh, a, a party that is much more constructively engaged on the international stage, embracing uh, a freedom agenda. I hope that the party becomes much more socially tolerant uh, than it is uh, today. And that we continue to embrace things like free markets, Again, with reasonable regulation uh, and, and, and properly run, but at the same time, we can we can we can get back into this type of a, of an agenda. But I think has helped define the Republican Party for much of its history. So, bottom line is this: uh, the United States of America is the United States of America is, is is seen as that beacon of hope throughout the world, and it is time for us uh, to reclaim that mantle of leadership engage, double down uh, with our friends and partners and allies. And together, you know, we can help put this world in a, in a better place and get our country on a better track. Thank you. Thank you to former Congressman Charlie Dent. And let's bring in Mariana and Reed. And Mariana, I'm so happy to see you back quicker than what I expected. <laughs> so Reed, I wanna to go to you first. Let's hear what people are saying on social media. You know what? I've had a lot of fun with these responses. Hal on Twitter says, concerned Americans with conservative views saying as a country, we need to say to Donald Trump in November, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Mariana. <laughs> yeah, Tim Lee is actually saying that he's watching the most important political convention held in 2020, the Convention on Founding Principles 2020, Truth and Integrity. See, you, you, I, I love that. Go ahead, Reed, go ahead. You know what's really great is that people have in, have taken these principles to heart. And someone with the handle love and integrity on Twitter says, you know, my two favorite principles are number one and number seven. Number one being all are created equal. But uh, they said number one is pretty obvious. But without number seven, none of the other principles can be achieved. Number seven is elected leaders have a duty to act with the highest level of integrity, honor, and service. So these are the these are the through lines that people want to see our our movement um, attend to moving forward. And sure, Michael, you know you've spent some time as a political consultant, and and you know that the clearest messages cut through. And if we're going to build a, a a party and a movement that is responsive to where people want to take the country. We have to be able to express what we stand for very clearly. So I invite the folks that are watching on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, 
please um, tweet what this movement means to you in one sentence. And let's oh, make I, it I really clear and shock the world. Come on, guys, keep that engagement going. Read, man, you need to be here next to me. I don't know why <laughs> we didn't have you here. <laughs> so Marianne, I want to shift gears job. just a, you're doing an amazing job, my friend. Marianne, I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk a little bit about President Trump. So the election is, is coming up, I think about 72 days away, I believe. Let's say we don't have the results at the end of the night. Let's say we wake up a day later, days later, weeks later, there are still no results. How do you think Donald Trump will handle that? And what will that impact be on, on the country and on the Republican Party? I think that is wonderful because the reality is, is come November 4th, if we wake up and we don't have a president because it hasn't been decided, Trump will work his darndest to ensure that he fights it tooth and nail, that he doesn't have to leave the Oval Office. It's absolutely ridiculous. He's already sowing discord and he's trying to delegitimize, delegitimize, wow, delegitimize our democracy and our elections before they've even taken place. He's trampling the constitution and the reality is Come November 3rd, the only way that we hinder this from happening is by ensuring he loses by a landslide. And Mariana, hey, let me tell you something. I, too, have messed up many times on air, so don't worry, girl. We got your back. <laughs> Rita, you. I want to go to you and talk a little bit about Joe Biden. So there are some Republicans, including yourself, who support Joe Biden. How do you convince other Republicans and conservatives to do the same? You know what? We know deep down what is right and what is wrong. And Donald Trump's cruelty is turning off many Republicans. There's a bunch of Americans who know that they can't go with their party's nominee this November. And so what we're doing at Biden Republicans is really trying to show people that, um, that you're not alone. And this is not a normal election. It is okay to put country over party and Republicans it's okay to vote for Joe Biden. It doesn't make you any less Republican because the stakes are this high in 2020. No, I think you're absolutely right, Reed. The stakes are very, very high. And I hope people get engaged and maintain engaged all the way to November, but even beyond. Mariana and Reed, thank you so much. Mariana, I hope we will see you again tomorrow, yes? Likewise. Absolutely, thank you guys so much. In 2018, we lost a true American hero and patriot who understood that there was no nobler calling than public service, which is why he dedicated his entire life to serving others. George H.W. Bush understood that to lead, one must be selfless and committed to higher ideals because it's those principles that reveal who we truly are. So it was, it was a traumatic experience, but no different than a lot of kids went through in World War II. And that's the point I want to make because people, you know, talk about well, your hero. Well, there's not, there's nothing heroic about doing your duty. He had been an envoy to China. He had been in war himself, as you well know. He had eight years as vice president of the United States and could watch what was going on in the Reagan years. Uh, he served at the UN, he served in the Congress. Uh, he was the director of the CIA. What other credentials do you need to be a successful president? We believe we believe that now that the world looks more like America, it's time for America to look more like herself. And so we offer a philosophy that puts faith in the individual, not the bureaucracy, a philosophy that empowers people to do their best so America can be at its best. In a world that is safer and freer, this is how we will build an America that is stronger, safer, and more secure. We know what works, freedom works. We know what's right, freedom is right. We know how to secure a more just and prosperous life for man on earth through free markets, free speech, free elections, and the exercise of free will unhampered by the state. We know that when freedom grows, America grows. And just as a strong America means a safer world, we have le learned that a safer world means a stronger America. Well, don't let anyone tell you that America is second rate, especially somebody running for president. This election, this election is about change, but that's not unusual. 
because the American Revolution is never ending. For a better America, for an endless, enduring dream and a thousand points of light, this is my mission and I will complete it. Thank you so much. And it was truly an honor to, for us to show the importance of George H.W. Bush. And I hope like many of you, we continue to embody the things that he taught us all. Let's bring in Mindy and Heath. And Heath, I wanna to go to you first and just get your initial responses about the life and legacy of former President George H.W. Bush. I mean, sure, Michael, when I think of President H.W. Bush, I think of really three things, duty, honor, and integrity. I mean, that really encapsulates a man, an American leader who, who really put country uh, before party. You know, Republicans, conservatives these days, they have their qualms with his policy agenda um, here and there. But when you look at that man, you, you knew that he cared about the country. He cared about his duty. And, and here's a guy that, you know, enlisted um, in the Navy at 18, got gunned down over the Pacific at 19, I think, or 20. And the first question he asked himself is, why was I spared? You know, what does God have in store for me? And I think that capacity for just humility and a sense of duty is something that is completely foreign today in Washington. We need leaders like George H.W. Bush in Washington, and we don't have any leaders like President George H.W. Bush in Washington. I couldn't agree more, Heath. And, and Mindy, Heath said, which I didn't know this, I think this was fascinating, George W. Bush asked himself, why was I spared? What does that say about who he was, about his character, about the content of his character? Yeah, you know, George H.W. Bush is a man that, you know, I kind of admi have admired for pretty much my entire life, once I became aware of, of politics. Um, certainly, he was he was running for president in my my early years in in following politics. I remember watching the convention where you know he gave his acceptance speech as a very young person. And you know, I think what when you speak to his character, it's we're talking about a depth of character. We're talking about a, a man who, of course, was defined by duty and honor and service, as as Heath mentioned, but also somebody who his entire life was striving to do more to give more to this country, to serve in, in bigger roles, to, to also kind of serve his family. I mean, he has this, this family that clearly he instilled in them a sense of service, given kind of where his son Jeb and his son you know, George W. ended up going, as well as other members of his family. And so this is, these are the types of leaders that you know, we used to have, not only in the Republican Party, but in the country that we could admire. And you know, one of my favorite things about George H.W. Bush is um, he was known as this letter, this prolific letter writer. He would write letters, you know, many, many, many letters a day. I mean, there's stories about the dozens or even hundreds of, of letters that he would write in a week. And, you know, I, I actually have one of those letters. I, I worked on uh, President George W. Bush's campaign and and we had a, you know, a letter go out from his father, uh, you know, to for fundraising and for volunteer recruitment purposes. And I had worked with not even him directly, but with his team. And he ended up sending me a personal letter for that. And it is one of my kind of most treasured memorabilia. So, you know, that really speaks to, I think tonight we have the RNC. I'm here at our, our great convention on founding principles, uh, but I've been able to look on social media and pick up a bit on that. And, you know, the, the bar has been lowered so much for what we expect from our leaders that, you know, for somebody like Donald Trump or, or even some of the others that are speaking at the convention, if, if they show a, uh, you know, an ounce of decency, they're, they're praised when, you know, really the bar should be that we expect our leaders to be decent, almost without fail, recognizing that, you know, all of us are imperfect and have our moments, but we should constantly be striving to those higher ideals. And, and Heath, George H.W. Bush understood that in order to lead others, one must be selfless. It has to be about the people you're leading and not oneself. When you think about the Republican National Committee's convention that's going on, and you think about our convention, talk about how different they are, how contrasting they are. I mean, it's a, it's a great point, Michael. If you look at the RNC, I mean, there was a graphic that went out in the early days of that half of the speakers were related to Donald Trump. Half of the keynote speeches were related to Donald Trump. Uh, and, 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 and the fact that you see tonight, Dan Crenshaw making news for not mentioning Trump's name in his speech as the only speech that did that, it says something about the expectation 
for Republican uh, members of Congress and members of the Republican Party. The expectation is, is that you are there to fet the man, the leader, the, the, the guy who is going to go out there and defeat the Democrats. Uh, and that's all it's about. It's about owning the libs. It's, it's, it's not about principles. It's not ideas. What this convention has been about, at least I hope that everyone tuning in has seen, is ideas. Why do we do politics? Why do we engage in these debates? Because we believe in things as a country, as a party, not even, not even think about party, but just as a country, who we are as people. We believe in things. That's why we engage in this fight. And I'm just honored that all the people uh, that are tuning in online, engaging in the discussion, are standing with us in this important fight because I think it's a critical time for our country. Oh, absolutely, Heath. And, and Mindy, we have a very interesting speaker coming up next. I'd like to know more about this individual. Yeah, so you know, Mr. Trammell Crow will be speaking soon. You know, Mr. Crow is is somebody that um, you know isn't necessarily a, a household name everywhere, but in his native Dallas, he is very well known. He has a family that has been long established in Dallas as uh, you know as as they were real estate developers, kind of like someone you may know, but also they were philanthropists and they were incredibly well connected politically. Uh, they were longtime donors to the Republican Party, but actually, you know, they also knew people from the other side because that's how it used to be when you were um, politically engaged in, and you were somebody who was a, uh, you know, a, a philanthropist and a business leader in your city. You, you, you would work with Democrats, you would work with Republicans, but this is somebody who's been a long term uh, time, you know, donor to, to lots of nonprofits and causes, but also to to Republicans, and you know what he his one of his main kind of focus areas right now is is the environment. He leads something called EarthX, which is actually the largest annual expo focused on environmental um, protection and and just preserving and conserving the environment. This is an event that can draw up to twenty thousand people in person uh, in Dallas. People come from you know all over to this event. You know ranchers and hunters and farmers to, you know, vegans and, um, and, you know, people whose main kind of cause, some might call them tree hungers, you know, environmentalists, <laughs> it like, it spans the spectrum. This is something he is really passionate about is environmental protection. And the idea that this is something that the Republican party, you know, once embraced and, and really needs to get back to a place where it is facing, um, you know, the, the climate crisis and threats to our environment certainly much more so than, than it is today. And you know, the other thing I'll just say about Trammell before introducing his speech is, as part of his activism on environmental issues, he has come, and just you know, generally having watched politics for, for you know, all of his life, he has come to a point where he sees that one of the greatest threats to the country is our, our broken political system. It is a system that incentivizes polarization and fear-based politics. Um, that it is about showmanship uh, and less about governing and solutions. And so he is on a quest to contribute, to raise funds, to dedicate his time to healing our political system, you know, ensuring that we can kind of transcend some of these partisan divides and the silliness that we see in our politics and, and move from a model of polarization to a, to a model of problem solving not just on the environment, but on a, on a whole host of big societal challenges. So with that, Trammell Crow. Politics is a game played by politicians, politicos, the media who don't necessarily want to win. I mean, they just want to keep on playing the game. It's a business. Stay in office as long as you can. Negative campaigns, News reporting aimed at just getting more eyes and advertisers. We're being played. We've got to fix our political system. The American democracy that I was taught in school, I still believe in. Any disillusionment along the way didn't make me lose my belief in my country. My vote still counts. But it's the money part that's the problem. The political industry is based on money and power. My campaign contributions just go to party politics, negative campaigns that wind up canceling each other out, ad campaigns, smear campaigns. Both sides are guilty, and I guess that makes me guilty too. But I'm not playing this game anymore. I don't want to be associated with it. 
I don't want to throw good money to bad campaigns that'll just be canceled out anyway. 30 top Republican and Democratic donors met on Zoom. Most of it didn't even know each other. As major donors from opposing causes and parties, we were spending millions of dollars against each other. But that day, we compared notes and realized we were just canceling each other out. Only the partisan power brokers were winning. They used almost every dollar we spend to divide ourselves. And it's legal. <laughs> it's led by the political industry, and they're, they've identified our weaknesses, and they're playing them against us. Their jobs to extract money from you and me. So we pay them and they pay us back with fake solutions. We pay them again. Every dollar, every ad, everything we buy pays them. And hold your nose candidates is what we get from swamping gutter politics. So our small gathering that day, we agreed that the only solutions to stop paying them we and you and five million people will declare our interdependence and come together to defund negativity and destructive campaigns. But we need you and everybody you know to come together. Five million people is the magic number in elections. 5% of the presidential vote, that's the number we need to decide every competitive election. To weed out the wackos and those who hate and choose between two problem solvers. Today, I'm announcing our new initiative headed by the donors at our roundtable to shift $1 billion of campaign contributions to support 5 million people, people like you and me, to support candidates who just aren't ideologues, but real problem solvers who will reach out across party lines to tackle the challenges that America faces. To tackle COVID and climate change, clean air, clean water, clean energy, economic prosperity, and energy innovation through free enterprise. To weave communities back together and fix our schools and stop overfilling our prisons. To assure liberty and justice for all, and to end the outrageous spending that makes this possible. We feel politically homeless in a sense. We found our home, we're Americans. We're solutions oriented. There's always solutions to problems. We're not nearly as divided as we've been led to believe by the political industry. Seven out of 10 Americans are committed as ever to our nation's founding principles. Even if we disagree on the details and seven out of 10 can still disagree without hate mongering. And we can work things out together. We the people will face our problems and solve them together. Thank you so much, Trammell Crow. There's a reason we call this the Convention on Founding Principles. It isn't just because we're declaring principles as a foundation for this movement. It's also because we're standing on the backs of giants. From the founders themselves to the visionaries and leaders who have battered and fixed this country since. They've handed us a legacy of principles which, while never perfect, have guided our nation to be the greatest and most prosperous in the world. But the work isn't over. There's so much still to do to ensure that this remains the shining city on a hill. Guarding that beacon of liberty is a duty that rests on all of us. It's been truly heartening and inspiring tonight to hear from so many public servants, political advocates, and social leaders who are committed not just to defeating Trump, but to correcting our national course and reorienting us around the principles which have made America a force for good and freedom in the world. But we're all in that struggle together from our speakers, our guests, everyone watching at home, yes, you. Together we can make sure this really shines brightly, make sure this country shines brightly. And like so many of you, that gives me hope. And as luck would have it, hope is what tomorrow night is all about. We borrow our inspiration for night four from yet another scion of American freedom, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope, Dr. King once said. We'll hear from young voters as well as established political commentators and leaders like my friend Tara Setmeyer, Mark Sanford, my friend Heath Mayo, Mindy Finn, and Evan McMullen. Plus, we'll hear from the man who once led the party that lost its way through Trumpism, my good friend and former mentor, Michael Steele. You won't want to miss a minute of it, so keep the conversation alive online by using the hashtag CFP2020 
and tell all of your friends and colleagues and even family members to tune in at this special time at 8 p.m. tomorrow. Good night and God bless.